check that out. I'm Kalela Williams, a program coordinator with the Free Library of Philadelphia Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. A nun, a pornographer, a hoarder, a five-year-old, a recovering addict, a recovering teacher. These are the people inhabiting the world of 40-year-old Portia Kane who, with nerve and energy, rests a new sense of self from the ashes of a failed marriage and a life lived only half full. And it's through both careful intention and serendipitous accident that Portia inspires and saves the lives of those around her and her own. Described by reviewers as alive with humanity, complex and fascinating, Matthew Quick's Love May Fail is a witty, unput-downable novel, a story of pretense and authenticity, offbeat characters who somehow and profoundly remind us of ourselves, and a heavy dose of heavy metal. No one writes quite like Matthew Quick, says the American Booksellers Association. Also known as Q, Matthew Quick was born in Philadelphia and grew up across the river in South Jersey, the setting of Love May Fail and many of his other works. A graduate of LaSalle University and Goddard College, he taught high school literature and film for many years, and Q's works have, appeared, have received a Penn Hemingway Award Honorable Mention and a New York Times Book Reviews Editor's Choice. He's the New York Times bestselling author of The Good Luck of Right Now, Forgive Me Leonard Peacock, Boy 21, Sorta Like a Rockstar, and The Silver Linings Playbook, which of course was adapted into an Academy Award winning film. Q lives on the Outer Banks of North Carolina with novelist and pianist Alicia Bissett, his wife and creative soulmate. Ladies and gentlemen, or perhaps more apropos, official members of the human race, please welcome Matthew Quick. I want to thank Kalela for that uh, wonderful introduction. Kalela and I were good friends at the Goddard MFA. Uh, we had a very tight-knit group of writing friends, and so it's wonderful to have her here. I want to thank the, the Free Library as well for having me. It's good to be back. I love to kick off uh, the tour here in Philly, which is home. Um, it's good to see a lot of friendly faces. Like my grandmom is right in the front row. Always gives me a lot of energy. <laughs> Big applause for grandmom. She, she's the real rock star. So this is my, my sixth novel, my sixth novel. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing because I can remember being in the MFA just, you know, several years ago and thinking I would never, ever publish a novel. And here we are at six. This is my third adult novel. Um, and I always hesitate to say adult novel because that makes it sounds like I write, I write sex books. <laughs> And there is a sex scene in Love May Fail. It's kind of a new thing for me, but it's not technically a sex book. You don't have to go to an adult bookstore to buy it. You just go to a regular bookstore. Um, but I say that because I also write books that star teens from a teen point of view, which are more commonly known as young adult books. So this is my third adult book, so I have three teen and three adult. And it was a labor of love to write, um, which is not always the case. I wrote this book, uh, I guess it was two years ago. It takes that long for publishing to, to catch up. And uh, it was at a time when I was kind of feeling low and this, this book kind of picked me up. And um, that, that's not always the case, which is, which is a beautiful thing when it happens. Love May Fail is about a lot of things. And I'm going to talk about two of those things tonight. Um, the first uh, is students and teachers. And I realize that's two things, but I'm going to count it as one. <laughs> And the second thing is creation and all of the, the good and bad that comes with, with creating something. So I'm going to talk about students and teachers first. Um, this book is about a, a teacher and a former student reuniting years after they leave the classroom. And most of you know I taught high school English for several years. And I taught at Haddonfield Memorial High School over in South Jersey. And I also taught at Eastern High School in, in Voorhees. Oh, some people from Eastern. Wow, Easterns get more applause than Haddonfield. Wow. That's interesting. Oh, some Haddonfield people too applauding. Flem is here, I see. And uh, I started teaching when I was maybe 22, 23, and I was hired to teach English. And some things about teaching high school English are really straightforward, like vocabulary or um, the five paragraph essay or uh, you know some grammar rules. You can, anybody can learn that and just teach it. But teaching literature is a little bit more complex. It's a little bit harder. 
And I always believed in literature from a young age. And to this day, I still think that we read novels to promote empathy. We read novels to promote tolerance, understanding, all of the things that they don't test for in the, on the SAT um, that, are, that we need. Hooray for reading novels in school. This is wonderful. I get applause like every 30 seconds in Philly. The whole tour is going to be ruined for me. It'll never happen anywhere else. <laughs> and so I also had this idea that uh, literature helps you form a life philosophy. And I started reading literature when I was a teenager. And it's a wonderful way to jump inside a different skull and see the world through a different viewpoint and to test out different philosophies, see what, see what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, and so I really want to encourage my kids to, to form their own life philosophies. The problem at 22 or 23 years old is that you're 22 or 23 and you have no life philosophy at all. Um, you have no experience. And basically, they hire you and they put you, they prop you up in front of 100 kids a day and they basically just say, go. Um, and so, you know, you have to think of something to say to all of these, all of these students. And so what I did for my teaching philosophy is I basically just stole the whole thing. <laughs> I stole the whole thing from a movie is what I did. Um, and the movie starred Robin Williams as Mr. Keating, right? We all know this film, Dead Poet Society, which I saw when I was 16 years old. I was a junior in high school. And the movie just blew my mind. Not only did I see that it was kind of okay to love literature, but I thought, you know, like teachers can really have an impact. And, you know, I just fell in love with the Robin Williams character. And so when I started teaching, I said, maybe I could be the Mr. Keating to my students. And so I started talking about Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. Um, you know, I tried to encourage my, my students to, to be extraordinary. But the one thing that I missed at 23 years of age, because I was so naive, and this is a little spoiler alert if you haven't seen Dead Poets, so maybe you want to clog your ears if you didn't. But the movie ends with the teacher getting fired, you know, and so this is my philosophy. Like, I'm going I'm to be like this guy, you know, and this is going to be my plan for surviving education long term. Uh, he gets fired. He doesn't even make it one year. And here am I. I'm trying to do this for seven years. And so it's no surprise that by the end of my, my teaching career, uh, after trying to be wildly optimistic and, and encouraging kids to, you know, think for themselves and, you know, buck the system, um, that I was really burned out at the end. Uh, I loved my students um, a lot. I did not like school politics one bit. Um, and I have a friend, Mr. Fleming, here tonight. We, he would always tell me, if you do it for the kids, you're doing the right thing. And I learned very quickly that not everybody does it for the kids. You know, a lot of people put politics before the kids, and that was really frustrating for me. And I left, when I left teaching, my, my faith in humanity was, was real low. Um, you know, I was really kind of in a bad place. And uh, a funny thing started to happen that, that picked me up after that. I started to hear from former students over the years. I would get back in touch with me. And a lot of times they wanted to get together. And my former students, when I was teaching, um, there was this thing because I was a young teacher and my students were about 18 and I was only 23. And so they would test the line of like whether you're like a teacher or not. And so they would ask you this question all the time. They'd be like, Q, can we have a beer together sometime? That was a question I got a lot. And I'm pretty sure if I said yes, especially my Haddonfield students, they might have reached in their backpack and had a beer with me right in the classroom. <laughs> But me being a good, you know, moral citizen living in the U.S. where drinking age is 21, I wore my teacher face and I said, well, when you're 21 years of age, you know, perhaps we might have a drink someday. And I thought that most of them would forget. They would never remember. Um, and most of them did. But some of them actually came around for that drink when they turned 21. And it happened in two different ways. Sometimes I would be at a bar in South Jersey or Philly and a drink would just magically appear unordered. And I would look around, the bartender would point, and there would be some of my former students, thumbs up, you know, we're 21 now, we're adults, and they would come over. Other times, uh, some students would contact me through social media or email, and they said, let's have a beer, and I would meet them out for a drink. And when you have a drink with your former students for the first time, it's exciting. You know, like you're, you're, kind, of, you're kind of acknowledging that they're adults. It's a ritual. And so you, you get the drink, and you clink the glasses, and, and you sip. And then it gets a little awkward a lot of times. <laughs> there have been notable exceptions to this, notable exceptions. But a lot of times, uh, you know, the former students would have a hard time using your first name, even though you asked them to use the first name. And I still can't call my high school teachers by their first name. 
and uh, eye contact might become a problem. And a lot of times my former students, they would list all their credentials in life. You know, they would just list their credentials. And I got the idea that they wanted me to give them a grade, perhaps, you know, like A plus for life. Uh, sometimes they have problems that they want to discuss with me, you know, they wanted advice. And that's all well and good, but the thing that was really hard for me was to figure out whether we were just two adults having a drink or was I going to be a teacher for my entire life. Um, and that was a really tricky thing because I think when you ask um, your teacher to have a beer, what you're really saying is treat me like an adult. But then I would go and have the beer and it seemed like be my teacher again. And that was a weird, a weird kind of line to walk. And it reminded me of something that happened when I was in high school at the end of uh, high school. When I was a student, I had a math teacher that I absolutely loved. He was, he was this great guy. And I loved him because he was realistic. And pretty much he was realistic about my ability to do math. <laughs> and that's why I loved him. Uh, to this day, I use math for two things. I can balance my checkbook within a couple pennies of accuracy, and if I've had less than two drinks, I can do the tip at the end of the meal. <laughs> That's what I can do with math. I was in the lowest math, you know, math for English majors, math for people who can't do math, you know, whatever you want to call it. And so every day I would come in and he would explain the same things to my class and to me in particular, and he was kind, he never made me feel stupid, you know, he just said the same thing over and over and I never got it, and then somehow I passed anyway. And it was this other thing that he did that I loved. Um, we learned very early on, if you asked him questions specifically about his daughter or his childhood, he would tell you stories. And sometimes the stories would go on for so long that you'd never have to do any math that period. <laughs> and for me, that was a good day. That was a good day. Not only because I didn't have to do math, but because I'm a storyteller. And I really loved listening to stories about his childhood. And the, probably the best compliment that I could give this man was that I felt safe in his classroom and at a time when I, I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin, I was comfortable in his room and I really admired that. And so one day, a senior year, I think it was in a study hall, we were about to go to Disney World for a senior class trip and he said, oh, you guys are going to Disney World, you know, you're not going to be here, seniors are going to be out here. I said, yeah, you know, we're, we're off to Florida and he said, that reminds me of a joke. And he said, uh, Mickey Mouse goes to psychiatrist. And then he paused and he said, I can't tell that joke. <laughs> and he says, uh, you know, it's inappropriate for school. Just forget that, delete that. You can't tell the rest of that joke. And so, of course, for the rest of the period, all we did was tell the joke, tell the joke. You know, we're adults, we're 18. And so finally he said, listen, when you graduate, if you really want to know the rest of the joke, after you graduate, you're no longer a student, come back and I'll tell you the joke. So I said to myself, I'm coming back, like no matter what. And so we went to Disney World. We came back for the last two months of school. Um, we put on a, the stupid hat and walked to the music and graduated. And the next day I came back and I found my math teacher. And I said to him, you got to tell me the joke. And he said, what joke? He had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, Mickey Mouse goes to the psychiatrist. And he's like, oh, no. He's like, I can't tell you this joke. I don't know why I said this. So you have to tell me I'm 18. I graduated. I'm a man now. I'm an adult. This is my moment. And so he said, Mickey Mouse goes to the psychiatrist. And I can't tell you the rest of the joke because my grandmother's here. <laughs> but I will say it involves a pun using the F word. And two of your favorite iconic uh, Disney characters from childhood having sex. <laughs> Needless to say, I was shocked. I was shocked. And the fact that I heard the F word was not shocking because people in my town were using the F word all the time, like from childhood. And I'd heard dirty jokes since probably first grade. But I was shocked that my teacher told me a dirty joke. And I'd asked him to treat me like an adult. And when he treated me like an adult, I wanted to be a kid immediately again. Um, there was just an awkward thing. And it took me a long time to figure out why I had that moment. And so Love May Fail, student and teachers, is really um, kind of an examination of, of, of how that relationship progresses uh, over the years. The other thing I said I was going to talk about tonight was creation, um, the good and bad that goes with creation. And for me, I create novels. And there's a character in the book who also wants to, to write novels as well. You got to take a break for water. And I should preface this part by saying I realize that I'm wildly blessed to be on this stage. The fact that people come out, 
to hear my stories, it kind of boggles my mind. And um, the success we have with Silver Linings and the fact that I can, I can make my living as a fiction writer uh, is, is a beautiful thing, and I'm very, very grateful for that, and, and it's not lost on me. But the writing life is, is, is often a, a very, very strange life. It's a very strange life. And a lot of times people will come to me and they'll say, Q, I want to I live the, the writing life. I want to be an artist. Um, how do I do that? Or they'll say to me, uh, how do I get an agent? Or how do I get my screenplay to Harvey Weinstein? Or you know, how, how, do I, how do I make it? You know, what's, what's the plan? And I always hesitate to answer that question, not because I don't have an idea of what to say, but because A, there is no X, Y, and Z. There's no like mathematical equation, although I'm not good at math, so maybe there is. Um, <laughs> but there's no kind of, if, if someone had the formula, everybody would, would do it. Someone would be making a lot of money. But also naivety can be uh, an artist friend, a great friend. When I started out, the fact that I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know what was ahead was, was really an important part of my success, I think. And I'm being serious about this. Um, there's a metaphor that I like to use that if you're going to climb a mountain and you see a huge mountain and you walk up to it and you know you've got to climb that mountain and you look up and you see that part of it is straight up and it, you know, it looks really daunting and scary at the top and you don't have the right equipment, you might just quit before you even begin and you might say, you know what, that's, that's out of my league. I'm never going to go for that. But if you walk up to the same mountain and two-thirds of it is shrouded in clouds, you might look and say, you know what, I don't know what's up there, but I can do that first part until I get to the clouds and, and kind of figure out what's there. And that momentum sometimes can, can really carry you through. I have a lot of writing friends and I've met a lot of writers, some of them um, quite famous. And um, one of the things that happens when you publish a book, and again, it's a real honor to publish a book and you always appreciate the fact that you're able to sell and publish a book, uh, is that a lot of writers privately lose their minds when they publish a book. It's, it's pretty consistent. Um, you know, if you know writers on the internet, like you follow them on Facebook and Twitter, and you see like this really lovely image of how their lives are, um, if you go to the bar with that same person, have three drinks, it's a different story, believe me. Um, and it can be very, very disorienting to, to publish a novel. And I, I've thought about why so many of my friends and my wife and myself have gone through depressive episodes uh, when you put your art into the world. Even, even sometimes when it, when it succeeds wildly, it can become really disorienting. And I've thought about this, and um, the answer that I've come up with is that, for, especially for fiction writers, I don't know about painters or other you know, musicians, but for fiction writers, you sit in a room alone for a long time, and you have this thing that you try to grow, and it's yours, and no one else knows about it. And at some point, if you grow it, big enough, you start to believe in it. And when you start to believe in it, that's when you become vulnerable because you reach down inside of yourself and you take all of the best of you, all of your beliefs, all the things that you love, um, all of your memories, and you put all of this really private good stuff into a book. And then you get it to the point where you can send it out into the world. And you have that moment for a second before no one else has read the book. And that for me now, I didn't know this when I first started writing, but that is the best part of writing. When I finished Love May Fail, I didn't show it to anyone for two weeks because I just wanted to savor that, that moment when it was still mine before I sent it out into the world. As soon as I send a book to New York or any of my friends sends a book to New York, it's no longer really your art, it's a product. It's really a product. And so I sent it to my agent, and the first thing that he'll think is, is this a Matthew Quick novel? Is it a Matthew Quick brand novel? And if it is, he'll be really excited about that. And he'll send it to either an editor I already have in a relationship with, or he'll try to find an editor by selling it. The editor, or you know, and the filmmaker too in, in LA, they think in, in two ways. They think, number one, do I like this project? And that's not as important, as important as can I make money off of this project? Because if they might love something, but if they, don't, if they can't make money off it, they can't, they can't necessarily buy it. And that's just the reality of the business. So once they decide that they're going to buy something, they come up with a, a number that they think is worth, and they pay you money. This is a happy day. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime anyone gives you money at all for your art is, is an amazing day. Um, and, and no matter how far you go in, in the writing world, you never know when that next check is coming. It's not like you get paid every two weeks. So it's a beautiful day when you get paid. But then as soon as you get paid, um, your editor will write an editorial letter. 
An editorial letter begins always the same way, with this tiny paragraph at the top about how excited everybody is to work with you, and we love this book so much, and we think you're a very talented author. And then it'll be 14 pages, single space, of all the things they hate about the novel. And it's so jarring the first time you get this, this editorial letter. I've done it seven times because my next book, Every Exquisite Thing, we've already gone through the editorial process. And it always, always, always makes the book better. I've never met a writer who said, I went through the editorial process and it made it worse, but it's jarring. And you realize that this, this thing that you created is no longer just yours, that it, you're on a team now and you're trying to make it as, as, as best it can be so that you can sell your product. Then when the book goes into the world, even if it's successful, you get all of these responses that are wildly different than the response that you had to your own art. And you realize that, A, it's not really yours anymore. And also, um, you don't understand how people are interacting with it because they have their own private, personal relationships. With Love May Fail, uh, my wife is always trying to get me not to read reviews, but I'm obsessive. And I, I'm like, I'm, maybe I'm, I don't know, I'm evil, but I, I just read them anyway. And even the good ones can be confusing. For example, uh, there was somebody who really liked Love May Fail. And they said, uh, you know, I remember reading it. It said, this is Matthew Quick's darkest book yet. You know, I love this book, but it's, it's kind of depressing. And it's, it's a little real turn from Matthew Quick. And I swear to you, the very next, re next review that I read, it said, this is a great beach read. <laughs> it said, take it to the beach. It's so much fun. It's a great book, but it's really light and fluffy. And so it's like, what do you do with that? You know, it's completely disorienting. And, and this thing that you, that you had so much control over and that so much love for, you realize it goes out and you have to let it go and you've got to um, start the next project. I'll tell you one story about Silver Linings, and this is a story I've told many times, so if you're a good friend of mine, you've probably heard it. And uh, it's a funny story, and it gets, it gets better if I've been drinking, and I haven't been drinking tonight, so I hope it will still be funny. Um, but it's about the first time I went through the publication process. Uh, Forrest Strauss and Giroux published Silver Linings, and, um, you know, it was my first time around. And the first time you publish a book, like, every author has these wild dreams of grandeur that are just completely unrealistic. Every author I know, you, you might not tell people about it, but in your heart you think you're going to be J.K. Rowling, like, the first day. You know, you're going to be Stephen King on day one. And, and you know, I, I thought that was going to happen, too. And so the book came out, and they, they planned a few a few events, which were actually really good events in retrospect. My debut was, they really did a nice job, but I didn't appreciate it because I hadn't been through it before. And, but I felt like it wasn't enough. So I started saying, I put the word out, like I want to do more events around Philly. And a friend of mine, he took me up on it, and he said, listen, uh, I have to organize this, this cocktail party. And in my mind, it was for, from my memory, it was, it was for architects. And he said, I'm going to do this cocktail party for architects, and in the building that we're going to do it in, there's a, a bookstore attached. And they don't really sell fiction, but we can get your book in. And I thought maybe, you know, we could set up a table and it could be kind of a win-win situation here. And I said, this is going to be great. I'm going to have an event in Philly. I'm a book set in Philly. Everybody's going to buy the book. And I thought there's going to be a line around the block. I was so excited. <laughs> and so I get there and my part of the event was open to the public. And then the cocktail party was kind of like a private thing for architects. And so I walk in, I set up my table, and my friend, he introduced me to some people who are running the, the show. And immediately they bought books, and I said, all right, we're off to a good start. These people are really nice. Then some of my former um, students came, some parents, a couple of Haddonfield parents came. A teacher that I was really surprised because I wasn't really good friends with this teacher I worked with came. And there was maybe like 12 people that came and bought the book, and then like the line started to just kind of dry up. And... Uh, all the people going to the cocktail party were in really well dressed and I was dressed pretty much like this, you know, and I didn't have a suit on and they're kind of like giving me a glance as they kind of run by the table. And I started to realize that, you know, my book has nothing to do with architecture. <laughs> like there's like really no reason for me to be here. Um, but I'm desperately trying to make eye contact. And my friend who was running the show, he was, he was doing this thing where he would go and try to pull people over to me. Oh, you'll love this book. And, and I f it, it brought up all these memories of junior high when you're at the dance and all your friends are dancing with people and you're on the side and there's some, there's really kind, kind person that's trying to match you up with somebody and everybody's like saying, no, no. Like, it's a very specific analogy, right? Very specific. Not that it happened to me. Um, and so I'm feeling really, really kind of awkward. And the, this man caught my eye. He was on the other side of the room, this man. And 
he was an older gentleman, maybe in his 80s, and he's impeccably dressed in a pinstripe suit. He's got a bow tie, and uh, he gives me this look. It's like a sneer. And in my mind, I knew it was evil. I knew it was evil, and I don't know if you're a fan of Game of Thrones, but every time one of the characters is going to do something horrific, like skin a person alive, they give this like evil sneer. Like That was a sneer. But in my mind, I tried to, I tried to spin it, and I had a real good relationship with my grandfather, and I said, old guys are usually nice. You know, they might, uh, if you endure their stories about the price of bread 50 years ago, they usually give you the attaboy at the end. And so I try to flip it in my mind. I try to say, you know, this guy's going to be nice to you. He's going to be nice to you. And he, he walked over to me and he, he said, did you write this book? And in my head, I'm thinking my name is on the book. I'm sitting behind a pile of books. But, you know, I went into to, to salesman mode and I said, yes, I wrote the book. And it's, uh, it's, sold in, it's set in Philly and, you know, it's a reference to the Eagles. And I think you'd really like it. And he said, I'm going to read the first chapter and tell you if I want to buy it or not. And I said, okay. And FYI, like, never do this to an author, ever. <laughs> it's, it's like the worst thing you could do. And so this old guy, he, he picks up the book. And I could tell like, he's not buying this book. There's no way. And he licks his finger, and he like, starts, you know, getting his saliva on the book, you know. And he's reading it, and he's got, like, this face like he, like, hates the book. Like, he wants to vomit into the book. And the worst part was he was standing, and I was seated. So my options were look up at him and see how much he hates your book, look forward and stare at his crotch, or like turn your head in this awkward position. And so after about what felt like 10 years, it felt like 10 years went by, finally he shuts the book, he puts it down on a table, and then he waits for eye contact, which is the cruelest part of this story. I give him eye contact with this like hopeful look on my face, like please buy my book, and he says to me, nope. <laughs> and he pops the pee at me. He pops the pee. He, puts, he walks away. And as he turns, he grins and he giggles and he kind of skips. <laughs> he's like, knocked me out. Like, you know, he's doing his like victory dance. And I felt so low. I felt so low and demoralized. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. And as I was doing my literary walk of shame on the way home, I thought to myself, why would this guy do this to me? You know, I thought, you know, maybe he's a sociopath. That could be one thing. <laughs> maybe he wanted to publish a book and never did, you know, and he's sad. I don't know. Um, but I, I just didn't, I, I could understand if somebody was not interested or, you know, just didn't like your pitch and then walked away. But to pop a pee at somebody just seemed, <laughs> you know, cruel. And in my head, I started telling myself a story. I said, you know, someday you're going to be on New York Times bestseller list and you'll teach that guy a lesson. You know, you'll never have to deal with a pee popper, bow tie wearing guy again. <laughs> Someday you're going to have a movie made and you'll never have to deal with that guy again. Um, but the funny thing about publishing in, in, in the writing world is that both of those things happen. Like I made the times lists. Um, you know, we went to Hollywood. We had a fun time. We had a movie. And you get more pee popper guys after that. <laughs> more of them come out. You can get like a target on your head and they just keep coming. Everybody wants to pop a pee at you. And... <laughs> So how do, you beat, how do you beat the pee poppers of the world? How do you beat them? How do you keep making art? Like how do you keep being vulnerable and taking the best that's inside of you and handing that out into the world when you know people are going to do that to you? And my answer to that is, is it's small things. It's really quiet, small things that really get you through. Um, for example, you know, sometimes some of my former students will follow along and read my books and, and they'll write me an email. And that means more to me than I can tell you. My wife, she's a, she's a beautiful, beautiful person and she edits my books and she'll tear them apart if she has to. She's a great editor, much better than I am. Um, but sometimes she'll be in the other room editing my work and she'll just break out into laughter. And I'll walk in, like good laughter, like she's not laughing at my work. <laughs> I'll say, what was so funny? And she'll come in and she'll say, oh, I love this part. And, uh, you know, we edit sometimes. We go somewhere nice, like we'll go to a lake in Vermont and we'll sit at a picnic table and we'll sit side by side and turn the pages and edit. We used to do it in Knights Park when it was nice when we were living in Collingswood. Now we go to the ocean. And those quiet moments, you know, writing for my wife. Vonnegut used to say you should only write for one person. And I try to write for my wife. And if it makes her smile and it makes her laugh, it's a small thing. I get letters from teenagers. They send letters to my P.O. box. Um, a lot of times it's, it's, it's my YA books they're responding to. And I love these letters because they're so honest. Um, and the first thing, they're almost the same letter every single time. And the first thing the teenagers usually tell me is it's a big elaborate story about how they didn't buy your book. <laughs> you know, they'll say, 
I didn't have any money, so I checked it out at the library. Or they'll say, uh, I didn't have any money, so I borrowed it from a friend. Or I got one the other, the other day where the person said, um, I went to Barnes & Noble and I read it. And every time someone came, I would just keep moving to a new aisle for eight hours and I finish it and then I put it back. Or my favorite one is that sometimes they'll say, I legally downloaded your book off the internet. <laughs> but then it would go on and it would say, uh, usually every time it's some kid that feels lonely. And they'll say, you know, I read your book and it made me feel less alone. And it's good to know that, you know, maybe some other people are thinking about these things. And that's why I went to literature. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to feel less alone. And that's a quiet moment. Again, I didn't get a sale from that. You know, no one in New York, it doesn't count towards the times list. Nobody, no, none of the business people care because there's no sale. That's a quiet, quiet moment, but it means something. And so love may fail, right? It's a grand thing, this concept of love. Like the big ideas in life, they might fail, but courtesy will prevail. The small things, the small little things, those are the heartbeat that keeps an artist alive, those little small things. So that's all I have to say tonight. Um, you can applaud if you wish. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now we're going to do Q&A. And you can ask me anything you want. Oh, there's a question over here. What was the background motivation to do Silver Linings, and what do you attribute to its significant success? Um, the motivation for me to write Silver Linings, uh, I, you know, I've, I've talked about this a lot, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, I was in the MFA program and I felt as though I was supposed to write very, a very literary novel and that's what I was trying to do. And then one day I came back to Philly and went to Eagles game and um, I saw a movie called Little Miss Sunshine, which I loved. And I said to myself, you should write, you should write a, a book that gives you the same feeling as, as some of the great films that you see. And you should write a book that um, the people in that your neighborhood might read. Um, I was reading Gao Xing Zhen at the time, a book called Soul Mountain. I did my critical thesis on it. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. And uh, I love it. I love that book so much. It's a great literary book, but none of my friends will ever read that book. Um, and so I wanted to write a book that, that I knew um, would be authentically me. Why, why did it have such a, a good um, response? It's funny. When that book came out, I thought for sure all Eagles fans would be right on that book. And I remember I would go down to the link with all these cards, and I would, I would put them in the bathroom, Silver Linings Playbook, you know? And, and then they'd, people would put them in the urinal and pee on them. <laughs> it was like, it was so sad. And it, really, the people who embraced that book before the movie were people from the mental health community. And uh, I got a lot of responses from people who said, you know, this book is, it reflects what I'm going through in some way. And it was the first time that I kind of had to confront personally um, my own battles with anxiety and depression. I feel like that book was me, it was, I was tricking myself into coming out. And, uh, you know, it was surprising to see how, how people responded to that. And then when we went on tour for the film, um, it was even more dramatic. Um, it gave people a lot of permission to have conversations that I think they wanted to have for a long time. Um, I'd just like to know a little bit about um, your writing process. Um, okay. Some people, you know, like Stephen King and others have said, write your first draft in three months or less. Um, other people, so when I wrote my first novel, it took me a year. My second one, I'm trying to shave that down. So some people are really pro-outline, some people are really anti-outline, you just gotta go process of discovery. I'm just curious what, um, now that you've been releasing your sixth novel in what, like seven years, something like that, I know you've got your quick turnover, so I'm just curious what your process is when you're starting a new manuscript. You know, I love Stephen King's own writing, and you know, I love, I've read a lot of books, like the Anne Lamont book was another one that jumps out bird by bird. Um, and I continue, I'm reading a, a book by Ray Bradbury right now on writing, and I, I love reading other, about other people's process, but um, I'll quote my, my writer friend from the UK, Liz Jensen, and her philosophy is whatever works. And she says, if you have to drink at 8 a.m., do it. <laughs> you know, like, whatever you need to do to get the book written. And for me, each, each book is, is a very different process. You know, like, Love May Fail is a lot of fun to write. Boy 21, which I'm proud of, was, got a glowing review in the New York Times. It was like a, a year of hell. It was like a year of depression where I couldn't get it right. And it was my, I felt bad for my wife because I was, I was very depressed and I couldn't figure it out. Um, I quote... Uh, the late great Charles Bukowski, and he he wrote a lot too. And people said, "Why do you are you writing so fast?" 
And he said, fear is a great motivator. You know, and I think for me, um, I didn't think that I would ever have a chance to be a full-time fiction writer. And I'm not sure that I even believe that it's going to last now. So, like, my philosophy has always been outwork the competition. You know, just, and, and that's maybe not the best philosophy because it can, my mental health can take a hit. And so when I write a book in, in six months, it's usually the only thing I do. And I'll, I'll write very obsessively. And, you know, that's been my process for the last eight years. But my wife for, for the last eight years has been trying to get me to change that process. Um, so I, I don't know. You know, I think you, you try to learn from everybody. And I think I, I'm very against any writer when they say you should do this. Um, I think the best thing you can say is this is what I did and it worked for me, but you got to do what's right for you. And so, you know, if it takes you a year to write a book, that's still pretty fast. You know, some people, it takes them 10 years to write a book, you know, and if it takes you two years the next time, I think that's okay. And if you happen to be able to write a book like Kerouac in a couple weeks, well, good for you, you know, I mean, but it's, it's going to be different every time. And I think you can really get into a lot of psychological danger when you start to compare yourself to other writers. Um, and you start to say, I have to be like this person or that person is really dangerous to do. You can go anywhere you want. I'll let you pick so no one gets mad at me. Matt, Jim Rogers, and I'm with Corinne Eirich. Oh, wow. 1998 Student Council co advisors at Eastern. Yes. Congratulations on your success. Thank you for a wonderful presentation tonight. And my question is, have you gone back to any teaching, at least teaching and writing? If not, are you thinking about it? I've done um, some visits. I did, a, I did a visit at Drexel University maybe four or five years ago where I, I spoke to, um, I don't know, it was like 700 students, and then I, I taught a writing class afterwards. And it was funny because I was really nervous about it and I hadn't taught for a while. And uh, when it was over, I wasn't even sure how I did, and, and the, the people that – set it up they're like oh you should come teach here you know you, you were amazing like this was really good and the students really had a good response and a lot of times when I visit high schools um, you know the people and they, they mean this as a compliment they're like it's a shame you left teaching you know it's a shame um, you know you, sh you should be back in a classroom um, but the truth is that being in a classroom on a daily basis was not good for me um, you know, like I, I like teaching, but just being in a structured environment and especially with politics and stuff like that at play is really I, I'm, I'm kind of a rebel at heart, you know, and I'm an introvert. I can I can be a fake introvert on the stage. And for seven years, I was a fake introvert in front of the classroom. But then I would go home and I would just fall apart. You know, it took it took every ounce of energy for me to, to do Q, you know, to be th that character in school. And then I would go home and I just had nothing left over for my art, for my life, for my wife. And and so now whenever I go and I have a successful experience teaching for a day, it's always really tempting for me to say, oh, I could do this again. You know, I may be part time or um, but my wife is always quick to say you are never teaching again ever. And the thing she also says is you will never coach ever again. <laughs> She did not like being a basketball widow, you know, she didn't like that at all. So I don't know, I'm, I miss working with young people and, you know, even in OBX where I live now, I have some teacher friends and they're always like, you should come into school, but um, I know that if I do it, I'll try to do it 100% and I'll get addicted again, you know, I just, I can't do anything halfway. If I do something, I do it all the way. And right now I'm trying to do the writing all the way. But thank you though, I appreciate that. Uh, Matt, great delivery, really. Thank you. You're so unbelievably Philly. It's incredible. I mean, I'm so, I'm so, <laughs> so glad that North Carolina well, has. We should have went to you earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask uh, an, another process question, almost like piggybacking off of the the second question that was asked. I was struck by the way you, you mentioned editing twice uh, in your remarks. You, remen you mentioned this formal uh, letter that you get when your your property, so to speak, has been taken in. Uh, and you said uh, it always helps, or I, you know, I, I work well with it. They're brutal suggestions, but and they're long, and there's a lot of them. But it's always better. And then you also reference your wife and the and the and the role that she has. Could you just talk a little bit about how you interact with the editing process? I mean, you know, what do you fight for? Like, no, I'm not changing that. What do you give up? Like, how does the editing process work for you in in either reframing what you tried to do or you going back at it and doing it differently. Just what's the interaction like? Well, um, it took me a long time to trust my wife. 
uh, with my work. I mean, the first time, if, you, if you're married to someone or you have a significant other and you let them edit your work for the first time, be prepared for hell. You know, the next couple is you, you fight. But then is, my, now I, I've learned to trust my wife. You know, she knows what a Matthew Quick book is. So now when she edits something, I just, whatever she says, I do it because it, it always, I know it's, she has my best interests at heart. She's probably the only person in the world that is a hundred percent in my corner. So I, I always listen to her unless this is some kind of radical thing with my editor. I want to get a process letter. My wife and I sit down, I read it first and then I, I vent, you know, I said, this is ridiculous. I'm not doing any of this. And then my wife says, you know, go have a glass of scotch, come back. And then we sit down and we go through the process letter and we, we mark it and we say, I don't care. And if it's an I don't care about this, you do it. You just don't think about it. Um, and then you mark the things that are, you know, probably would, okay, I can see that. Like that would make this clear if, if something's clearly off or wrong and then you, you do those. And then you choose very carefully the stuff that you're going to fight for. And the stuff that you're going to fight for, you, let, you sit on it for a week. I never send it back. You wait. You wait. And then... Then I call my agent and I'll say, you know, what do you think? You know, and I'll, I'll let him weigh in and give his opinion. And if I really, if I really believe in it, I fight for it. My, my editors that I've worked with, um, particularly at Harbor College, Jennifer, um, Jennifer has been just uh, amazing. You know, so she, if I fight for it, she'll, nine times out of ten, she'll be okay. And Alvina Ling at Little Brown, too, has been really good that way, too. But you have to... You have to be realistic not only about the project, but also how people are going to perceive the project. Um, it's always, there, there's a lot of political camps out there, especially in YA. Um, and so the things that I bristle at are when people say, you know, like this group of librarians is going to be upset by this political thing. And, you know, because I don't think books should, should be about pleasing certain political groups, but if it's about um, making the story better, more accessible to a larger group of people, then you kind of weigh it, but it's it's not an exact science. Maybe we could go to the back of the room a little bit, or hi, um, I'm interested in writing, and I was just wondering how you were able to perfectly portray the mental illness in Silver Linings. Um, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that uh, the vote of confidence and the compliment. Uh, you know, that's. There's a couple of things that informs my, my view of the mental health world. Uh, when, I first was when I first graduated from college in South, my first job was working at Bancroft in, in Haddonfield. And I transitioned kids who were diagnosed with severe autism to a classroom where I ran behavior therapy programs. So that, that was part of it. I also worked in a place called the Lindens to make extra money because at Bancroft, I think it was making $8 an hour. So I'd work nights at the Lindens and that was a lockdown unit for people who had suffered brain trauma. So in the book, Pat um, had suffered brain trauma and you know I didn't make that very specific at the beginning. In the movie, David made it like he's clearly bipolar. In the book, he's suffered brain trauma and has bipolar tendencies. So it's a very different thing. Um, and it's funny too, because people who have worked um, with people diagnosed with brain trauma, like they'll always read the book and they'll know. They're like, you, you, you experienced this firsthand, like you know. Um, and I always say with mental health issues, if you know, you know. Uh, the other thing, I counsel a lot of uh, teenagers when I was working um, as, as a high school teacher, kind of unofficially, I did a lot of therapy, um, for lack of a better word. And, you know, some of it is firsthand experience, you know, like dealing with anxiety and depression. Um, you know, I, I have terrible anxiety, you know, it doesn't seem it now, like, but like an hour before I came up here, like it was, you know, I was like ready to, you know, a lot of anxiety, you know, so that's, that's been kind of a, a battle for me, um, as well. So. Hey, Matt, how are you? Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I actually grew up in the row house that you uh, wrote your stories about. The middle <laughs> of, I'm from Haddon Township, and I thought that was kind of funny. And um, I'm also in the music business, and I wrote a song called Row House Blues. I finished mixing it like two weeks ago, so I thought that was kind of weird. Well, and my question is, it's two questions. Um, is the new book that you just finished going to be made into a movie? And the second question is, do you know any music coordinators that I can send the song to? <laughs> hmm. Um, yeah, no, don't send it to my agent. He'll be, he doesn't deal with mu music. Uh, this book is, has been optioned by Sony, and it's now 
uh, in the works of going to TriStar. There are, are some like amazing rumors that I'm not allowed to tell you about tonight. Uh, it's frustrating because I would love to tell you about these rumors. Uh, I really don't have anything to do with the music. All of my books have been optioned for various projects. I, I will tell you a funny story, though. You might know that in the movie version of Silver Linings, Pat's trigger song is My Sharia More by Stevie Wonder. And in the book, it's Kenny G. And people are always like, why did they change that? And uh, in the book, it was originally Stevie Wonder. It, like, I had written that in the book, and then we tried to get clearance for it, and they threatened to sue us. <laughs> so we ha I had to change it at the last minute, and it went to Kenny G because we didn't have time to get permit permission for lyrics. So I needed something without lyrics, and so that's why it went to Kenny G. And then I remember when I, I was promoting with David O. Russell, somebody asked that question. He's like, because he had the original book, so he thought that he had kept that consistent. And he said, why did you change it? And I told him, he said, you should have called me. I would have called my person, and we could have got that for you. And I'm like, yeah, thanks for telling me that now. You know, like, <laughs> it would have been great five years ago. Um, but, you know, the, I think there are people in Hollywood that do that. And unfortunately, I, I'm not really connected to those people. Like, I'm connected to the people that that sell books to movie producers and get me to write screenplays. And, you know, it's a very team approach in L.A., so um, they also want you to, to be, like, one thing, too. Um, so if I called up, you know, the people in the Weinstein Company tomorrow and said, hey, I want to talk to some movie, or some music person, they would probably just say no. <laughs> like, I would just they're like, no, that's not what you do. Like, you do this other thing. So it's not really my field, unfortunately. Thank you, Q. That was a great, great talk. So, Q, so much of what you've taught about and written about is about um, bucking the system and marching to the beat of your own drummer and kind of rejecting conformism. And to achieve the level of success that you have, to, to a large degree, you have to operate within the system and play by the rules to a certain degree. And, you know, the publishing rules, and you touched on a lot of this already, but I think my, my question to you is, within that system, how do you stay true to yourself and to your motivations? And you did touch on a lot of this already, but, but how do you keep that, that core of what makes you, you, playing within this system? That's a good question. Um, they're all, they've all been good questions. And, you know, it's difficult because um, when I was in grad school, the MFA program, I realized that academia is kind of a herd. And it could be a good herd. You can learn a lot in academia. You can learn a lot at grad school. But if you try to write like your teachers, you're going to end up like being in academia forever, you know. And I think there was a time, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. And but there's a time when I realized that in order to be noticed, I had to do something different. Like I had to write like me, you know. I I, I couldn't write like even my heroes. Like if I had tried to write Gal Shing Jan or Charles Bukowski or Vonnegut or or whomever, like that wouldn't have worked because it wasn't me. Um, but the funny thing is, as soon as you, you have that voice, like people want to own it and they want to, to, to do things with it. And so you pick your battles. And I think the best way to, to get through it is really to have a, a life partner who knows you and, and can be your radar um, and can tell you like when you're going too far. And there's temptations all the time, you know, um, when things aren't going well, you start thinking like what, what's on the market that's going, you know, maybe I should write you know, some type of thriller or, you know, try to chase something. And my wife will say, just do what you do. You know, keep being you, you know, keep keep uh, doing what you do. And so I would say Alicia, I would give her a lot of credit for that. I don't think I'd made it, make it this far if I didn't have that, that rock, you know, my wife in my corner. And I think, too, the, the other thing that's really important is you have to you have to surround yourself with people who get you. Um, and if you have some people in your life that are pee poppers, you know, that like, like to pop the pee at you, you need to get them out of your life. And it doesn't matter if they're your friends or their family or whatever. If you're going to be uh, an artist and try to do something, you cannot be around those people that try to bring you down. Like you gotta, you gotta be around people that celebrate who you are. Um, and so that's really important too, protecting yourself. Um, the other thing I would say, I guess the last thing I would say is you need powerful allies. Uh, you know, as much as, I like to think, you know, I wrote a great book and, you know, we had a movie and all of that. Um, my agent 
who got my book and picked me out of the slush pile and has believed in me from day one before I had any contracts. He gets what I do, and he's made a lot of really great things happen. And my agent in L.A. too, Rich Green, um, he, he loves my work. He legitimately loves it, and so he fights for it um, in a way that possibly other people wouldn't. So you need those allies too, but it's tricky. You know, It's definitely tricky, and there's no formula for it. And I've made a lot of mistakes, and I try to learn from them. I said I wouldn't pick. I almost went to it, and then I'm like, oh, I can't. Everyone else would be mad at me. Where did you get the idea to write Sort of Like a Rockstar, and how long did it take you to finish it? I wrote Sort of Like a Rockstar. Wow, it's so long ago. It's hard for me to remember. Um, I think, you know, that book, I always say that Amber Appleton is the daughter I'll never have, you know, is, is how I describe her. And, um, you know, I think she she kind of came out of a lot of my, my experiences teaching. You know, she's kind of this oddball kid with a heart of gold, and those were always my favorite students, um, the, the free kids that didn't really fit in but had this beautiful heart. I think that I wrote that book. It might have taken me six months. That was another fun book to write. It was I found Amber's voice, and I just flew through it. I flew through that book, and that was a tough book to publish because my editor, Alvina Ling, bought that book, and she was just convinced that like it was going to win every award and like way hyped it up. And that book has done well, but it's never you know had the success of Silver Linings, and um, it's been at at Fox for a long time too, and the, like the movie has kind of been out there on the horizon. So it's a book that I love, and and yet it's my it's probably my least read book at this at this point too. So. I don't know why that is. That's that's another weird weird thing about publishing. Like the books that you, you're sure are going to be the hits, uh, are never are, and then people like things that you you weren't sure about. It's just weird. It's just a weird spin of the you know roll of the dice, spin the wheel kind of thing. Any other questions? Yeah, or oh, lots more. I can go all night. <laughs> Mine's very short and not very literary. Did you ever hear from Richard Gere? <laughs> um, a little synchronicity. When it was first set up at DreamWorks, one of the players who set it up was Richard Gere's agent. And uh, he was like, Richard will love this. And he's a good sense of humor. And so we sent him a copy, and then we never heard from him, which really didn't surprise me. <laughs> Um, but there were rumors about him participating, perhaps in the the film adaptation. I was that the Good Luck of Right Now was so close; it was as close as can be to a green light um, to being made in 2014. And Dayton and Farris, whom I met with, they did Little Miss Sunshine, and they're just they're just wonderful people. I was so excited to be working with them. They had a big fight with Steven Spielberg over the over casting, and they walked. And that, that was like ripping my heart out because I just, I really wanted to work with them. And I, I might in the future, they're, they're really good people. Um, but that's, that's just the breaks, you know, so I, I didn't get to see yet um, whether Richard Gere will participate. I have read the screenplay. Mike White wrote the screenplay, it's really good. And it's still active at DreamWorks, so that, that could be coming, we'll see. Two more questions, choose, choose wisely. So my question is going to focus more on Forgive Me, Leonard Peacock. Um, I guess my question is really almost a similar question with where did that inspiration come from um, and where did you find that connection with um, Leonard Peacock specifically because it's not, um, it's never, it's not a book that I've ever read before. And when I picked up this book and I read it, it wasn't a book that I could sit down and move along from. Um, it was a book that everybody else in my life sat on the sidelines until I finished that book. And then until I finished reading every single review about that book and until I finished reading all the analysis that people were putting out there. So my question is really, where did your connection come in with, with the character of Leonard Peacock? Leonard Peacock came at a time when I was trying to write a different book. It was, I was really, really frustrated. I've told the story before and then I went to go see my friend Liz in, in France and she has this lovely house in the French countryside and it's the, it's the most heavenly place in the world and, and as soon as I couldn't write for two months and as soon as I got there I, this voice came into my head and it said I'm, I'm this teenager who's 18 that's going to shoot people and I'm thinking why am I thinking about this in France and uh, for that book I wanted to write about you know whenever there's a school shooting or you know which happens far too often you know everybody 
on the news is quick to say, you know, what's wrong with kids these days? What's wrong with teachers? And, you know, as a former teacher, it bothers me that, you know, on all the days when someone doesn't shoot up at school, we don't go in and say, who's the hero in the school today that kept a kid sane? You know, who, and, and so I wanted to write a, a book about that. I also counseled a lot of angry teenagers that were secretly angry. Like they were kids that on the outside, like, yeah, I'm going to Harvard, everything's great. And I'll tell my guidance counselor, you know, all of this stuff that's gonna get me a good letter to Harvard. But privately, I'll tell Q all about all these things that are really messed up in my life that no one else wants to know about. And I was kind of like that in high school too, you know, like you put on a mask and you have all these conflicting feelings. And um, I don't, I'm trying not to give spoilers for Leonard Peacock, but there's very specific things that, that happened to him that uh, people don't want to talk about. And so I wanted to write a book where people would talk about that. And, you know, that, that book has been, you know, is absolutely polarizing. You know, there are people that I get letters all the time, you know, people thank you. Like this, literally people say this book saved my life, you know, and, you know, that's a wild thing to hear as, as an author. And then I'll get people that say people like this don't exist, you know, and it's, it's, it's sad to me because there are Leonard Peacock characters out there and we should be having conversations about them honestly. Um, we should be trying to reach out to those kids. But a lot of times um, we would rather talk about sending kids to Harvard, you know, or SATs or whatever. We don't want to talk about those things. And so I thought it was important to write a book about that. I think we have one more. I won't pick it. <laughs> I'll make someone else the person who picks. Hi. Uh, earlier tonight, you talked about the devastating part of creation, but you yep. also said that, you're, that, that Love May Fail brought you out of your deep, dark place. Can you talk about how it brought you up? Yeah, I mean, my my high, you know, is writing. You know, I love writing. Um, I, I would do it if no one was paying me, you know, and I, I did do it for many years. No one gave me a dime. I would write all the time. When I was teaching, I would spend whole summers writing, and um, it was how I took all the chaos in my head and all the chaos in my mind I would try to make order on the page, you know, so it was, it's therapeutic for me to write, and my heroes all say the same thing, you know, and... And the troubling part is, you know, doing that and having a good experience with it and then sharing that with the world and then having someone pop a pee in your face, you know, like, and I, I realize that if you're going to collect money for your art and you're going to get a paycheck, you're going to have, you're going to have to accept criticism and you're going to have, if you're going to accept the praise, you're going to have to accept the criticism, but it's a really personal thing to, to, to write a book. And so I'm a very... It, introverted person you know like I don't do this like on a stage every day like this is rare like this is not who I am like I'm a guy who sits in alone in, in a room and tries to figure it out and so you know it's a trust exercise and it, it's a weird relationship it's the same thing for teaching you know when I was teaching every day I went in and I said this is going to be really hard for you to get up in front of people but you I also knew that there was going to be some kid that would come to me at the end of the day and want to talk to me and so I'd want to show up for that kid um, but it would also be that give and take of being exhausted at the end of the day. And so publishing for me, it, it's, it's been a strange relationship because now it's how I, I make my living. Um, you know, so, and I'm very grateful for that, but it definitely is different than when you're just writing for yourself and balancing those two things is um, an act that I think I haven't mastered yet. And I think most of my writing friends haven't mastered it. And maybe you never master it, you know? I mean, even the people in LA that I talk to, um, the filmmakers, the actors, like, we, we all kind of privately struggle with this. And for me, my whole thing is I, I want to talk about it. You know, there's a lot of writers that I know that would never get up and say this. And yet they're twice as anxious as I am privately. And I, I think that's that's OK. You know, if they don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But I, I like to talk about these things because I know there's people out there that say I know there's probably somebody in the room right now that says, you know, I'm struggling with anxiety or, you know, I don't know if I can deal with this, um, but I really want to write a book and I really want to publish. And so I hope that if I say this, if I'm honest about it, it may, might give other people some hope and, you know, um, to say that it is possible. Um, but it, it is it is a tricky relationship, and uh, I'm not sure that I mastered it yet, but we're going to end on that. That was a weird place to end. <laughs> All right, I'll be signing books. Oh, standing applause. Wow. Thank you.